from Sirius XM's Doctor Radio. This is Coronavirus, everything you need to know now. From the Internal Medicine Show, here's Dr. Ira Bright. Everybody says isolate for two weeks, and well, it's been a month, and I guess the question is, just because it's been a month, does that mean the disease has disappeared? A lot of people are saying a month is enough, but that, I, I know that's not true, but can you just tell us why? Yeah, sure. So the important thing about that is that if everyone were truly socially isolating and completely quarantined, not interacting with anyone at all, all of us just individually for you know, maybe three weeks, then, then you're right. You know, this thing might die out. But the key thing is that we just can't shut down all social interactions at all. You know, there is still disease spreading in all sorts of different places around the world. And there are people, there are essential workers who still need to go to work. And even if you're in your household only interacting with, you know, say four people, there's a chance that one of you could be infected and then you could spread it to the next person and the next person and the next person. And if you do that all sequentially, then somebody in that household is infected for four times two weeks. You know, you're, you're on the order of two months now. Right, right, right. Exactly. And so all of a sudden, these time frames become much, much longer that you need to do the social distancing to maintain control of the outbreak. So, so that's why we're not seeing it die out like one might expect. Right. And just to, I'm going to leave it with the point is for everybody is like, oh, it's only a few people. Remember, this disease started with like one person. So if right. one or two people go out and get everybody sick, it will spread again like wildfire. More of us are, I don't want to use the word pushing the envelope, but yeah, I'll use it pushing the envelope. We're like, just it's hard to take at a certain point and people are meeting outside they're meeting at a distance they're trying their best but they're not necessarily sitting in their apartments full time or sitting in their houses full time did your model look at those types of behaviors or how do you even model the sort of i'm doing pretty good type of social behavior (laughs) Yeah, so in the models, we tried to take account of basically just what you're saying, you know, a whole spectrum from like, I'm doing nothing to I'm doing everything to I'm doing pretty good, you know, everything in between. And so, again, the way that we did that in this model was just varying the expected number of people you're going to infect. And these things are not easy. And, you know, they're not easy on a personal level, but they're also not easy on like a social and societal and economic scale. And so we're not saying that long term social distancing is a good option. But I think one of the good things is that the point is not to completely eliminate all interpersonal contacts. The point is to scale them back, to basically make the disease a little bit less infectious so that we can stay on top of it. And so I think that as long as you're being mindful of your behavior in these sorts of ways, if you're able to stay home and not interact with anybody, you know, great, that's that's some heroic effort from you. But, you know, as long as you can really reduce your contacts and sort of be mindful about who you're interacting with, how frequently, for what amount of time and with what distance between you, then every little bit helps. And I think that's really key, the message, the key message to get out. And so in terms of figuring that out, what can we get away with without going crazy? Like it seems that going clubbing seems like a bad idea. Like I'll <laughs> give it at that. You, know? right. you and a thousand other people packed in a really tight space, sweating a lot and breathing all over each other. <laughs> no, that seems just bad. And obviously sitting in the park six feet apart seems reasonable. Is there a way, I know at the moment you're just modeling by going, well, we'll set up 1.5 people you infected will be 1.7 and we'll run those numbers. Is there a way from a research point of view to try to figure out how much you can get away with? Or is this one of these things where some communities basically going to have to say, we're going to allow, you know, regular retail to open again. I can buy, you can buy a pair of shoes and a pair of pants, but we're not going to allow other things. And then you have to just sort of empirically see what happens. You have to actually see what's going on or can you use modeling to try to help predict what's good social distancing with the data we currently have? Yeah, so I think we can do that on a couple of different scales. So you may be familiar with a study that just came out that was essentially <laughs> looking at how far a person sneezes. You know, and so we can measure sort of how far these droplets that are potentially responsible for the spread of transmission actually spread. And so that can give us a sense for sort of how big that box that you were talking about needs to be. So you know, that's on one scale. On the other hand, different countries around the world and even different states and different cities here in the U.S. are doing different things to try to stay on top of this virus. And that will translate probably into different rates of disease spread. And so in the next few weeks, we should be able to take a look and you know, compare the different rates of spread between different places and ask what they did. And then that'll allow us to sort of correlate, you know, how much does each measure, you know, how much do school closures contribute to reducing transmission versus closing businesses versus, you know, instating curfews and these sorts of things. 
And so I think that we're still a little bit too early on to have those numbers for sure, but that's another direction we're going. The last thing is that people are looking at these aggregated cell phone records and looking at basically what's the change in the amount that people are traveling and how does that correlate with the spread of disease too. So that's sort of a proxy of social distancing. You know, if, if your phone used to travel all over New York City and then now it's sort of staying in one small apartment, then, you know, that suggests that you're doing a lot of social distancing. And by that change, we can correlate, you know, how does that change relate to how quickly the infection spreads? So that's something people are working on actively right now. Get facts, not fear, from Sirius XM's Dr. Radio, presented by the leading experts from NYU Langone Health. To learn more about Dr. Radio, including shows and schedules, go to SiriusXM.com slash Dr. Radio.